Timer is on, 10 minutes. Cool. Here we go. Cantor offers. Yes. Everyone is sick to death of cantor offers. <sighs> How to deal with them. Let's be honest. I would say, from all the consultants that we know, how many of their jobs at offer stage get rejected because of cantor offer? My guesstimate would be 40% at the moment. Oh, I reckon you could say, yeah, yeah. It, out of the, re it's the number one rejection reason. Yeah. And I don't know anyone who would have dealt with it more than you. Yeah. You know, like if, if you think of like normal rejections for counter offers and then you think about rec to rec. Oh, fuck's <laughs> sake. There's a reason I don't do rec to rec anymore. Yeah, that's true. It's true. <laughs> no, that is like actually the main reason. <laughs> um, but I think what, you know what the reason is? Why people, I think, fall, I was going to say ill, foul, foul to this. Yeah. Is that they haven't actually <laughs> done the prep work that was required. And so they get to the end stage of, oh great, I'm so excited, yeah, here's the offer. And they obviously get rejected and all the candidate goes, no, I'll take it, I'll think about it, they get a cancer offer, it all fucks up. Mm. They haven't actually prepped the candidate from the first interview. What are your motivations? What are your drivers? What's actually going on within your current situation? And why are you potentially interested in a new move? Mm. Those reasons they typically get at the start and they completely forget about them. They go, okay, they're now interested. Take them through the interview process. Let's never look back on your original reasons. But I think the ones that do this really well constantly in every conversation with that candidate reinforce and remind mm -hmm. candidates why they initially started looking. So in a prep call for their interview, I always remind candidates, ah, oh, so blah, 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 you mentioned that it was important to you. I'm really excited for this interview for you because of X, Y, Z. These are really reinforcing mm -hmm. the reasons why they were originally looking. Well, I think, I, yeah, I totally agree. And I think it's like, there's some things in recruitment that will never ever get old, right? It's like, there's changing technology, there's all these digital innovations, right? The fundamentals are still the fundamentals. If you are not pre-closing your candidates mm. at every single stage of the process when you have them in process, you're not effectively controlling the process. And we talk so much about that candidate control. You can't control a person's opinions and decisions, but you can control how the process will run. And I think it's getting back to in that first conversation or you know, proper sit down that you have with the candidate, mm. actually going, well, what are your drivers? but also what would cause you to stay? Like, yeah. what would your company have to offer you today for you to go, you know what, that is too good for me to turn down. And I think for a lot of candidates, it even goes back to even before that saying, do you understand that in this market, your company will find it easier to keep you mm. than rehire and not in a negative way. You obviously do a really good yeah. job, blah, blah, blah. But they will find it easier to keep you and more cost effective to keep you. Have you thought about how you will address that conversation? Because if you're looking now, you need to start thinking now about what would cause you to stay and what would cause you to leave. And I think even explaining that to a candidate and giving, showing the candidate what their company's motivator would be in that almost blows it apart yeah. anyway. But it's like, oh, it's not because I'm special, it's because it's cheaper for yeah. them. And also, it's not a surprise. I think when it becomes as a surprise to candidates at mm. the end stage where you haven't actually told them, hey, you expect a cancer offer, it's a surprise and it's a huge oh. ego boost straight yeah. away. So, oh, oh my God, they love, love, they love me. <laughs> yeah, but if you take that power away from the current company by saying they are, as you said, they're going to make a cancer offer to you because you're very good and you're in demand in the market and this is what it costs typically an agent of the company to re-recruit for your role. They are going to try and keep you. And what does it look like? What does it mean to you? Because if the reasons why they're moving, they're telling you, say for example, they tell you, the candidate tells you, I'm looking for a move because I'm not getting paid enough. Mm. Um, and I've done, they've promised me this promotion to leadership and they've never delivered on it. What I would do in that scenario is, okay, cool. At the end of the conversation, just look, just want you to think about this. How would you react if your current company gave you an extra twenty thousand dollars? Would that make much of a difference? Probably not. As it's not about the money for me completely. Okay, cool. What if they actually offered you an elevator due to a leadership role? Would that make a difference? Probably. Well, how would you feel that they would do that based on a counter offer? Mm -hmm. Would that make you feel good that they were doing it based mm -hmm. on a counter offer? That's a good point. Um. So. Have, 
workshopping that with them from day one so that's completely a given that they're going to get a canter off so when it comes it's not a surprise and it's not an ego boost it's they know all the facts they did exactly what we thought they would yeah. do i think where i get a lot of questions around this with consultants is like that what happens if it's a passive candidate and this we're like we're doing so much head hunting at the moment and so a lot of people ask me yeah but if it's a passive candidate and you you're the one who's trying trying to retract them out of their role. Mm. You know, how do you deal with that? But I think the conversation still stands because, you know, then it, I guess it comes back to, you know, what are the drivers for you to move? Mm. And realistically, like, what would a need to, an offer need to look like to get you to move? That still helps you understand yeah. what their company would then need to offer mm. back. And I think it's just having that upfront conversation. I know you're not looking to move at the moment, mm. but you know, you're open potentially mm. to exploring this opportunity with me, what would your company need to come back on if we could get you yeah. exactly what you're looking That's for? Exactly I think it's yeah. so sad. That's such a good point, because that is, always comes up, well, we can't trick passive candidates like the hang two ones, but absolutely you can. If they said yes to some engagement with you to explore, they're looking, yeah. they're open to a conversation, and there's a reason. No one that's completely happy and content in their role will consider a move, realistically. No, but apparently it's like, the stat is it's something like 80, it's over 80% of Australia's employed workforce that are open, like passively open. Mm. Which means that people are moving for the right thing. And I think the minute you get a candidate in a process for you, you get to treat them like an active yeah. candidate. You don't still have to dance around. The candidate might still be like, well, I'm still not quite mm. convinced that I'm leaving. You still yeah. get to pre-close them. Mm. You still get to talk about their drivers. You you have to manage mm. them like an active candidate. You can't do this and go, well, if I could just get them an offer, I might yeah. get this over the line. And then you turn around and go, oh, well, that fell through. Yeah. It's a control thing. You know what the other thing is, which you bring up in our courses quite often, which I think is really, really good, and I never really thought about it like this. And you see recruiters doing this when the cancer off conversation happens. They're like, no, do you know 80% of cancer off is that? Do you know this? And it's like, oh, come on, you're sounding desperate. Like, yeah. stop it. <laughs> and your counter is, or your alternative is, hey, look, I'm not going to let you on cancer off this. Why don't you go away and do some research? Yeah on the effectiveness of cancer off and how like can people are to stay, I think the results might surprise you. Yeah. I think it's that's such a, it's so much more powerful because it's not you go you've got a vested interest. So they're going, of course they're just gonna say that. Mm. Like, oh here we go. Like I'm not really listening because I'm being lectured. Yeah. And I think it comes back to the tone, definitely. Like you have to be confident, otherwise the candidate's gonna shut you out. But yeah, what I always say is like you go and do the research mm. and you form your opinion. And another question I always ask candidates are is if you accept that offer, what will this look like in 12 months time for you? Because mm -hmm. I think people always look at it as a quick fix. Yeah. And when you go, oh shit, I would actually have to be there another yeah. 12 months to make it worthwhile. That's when candidates start going, I don't know if I could actually yeah, do this. Yeah, that's true. Okay, 10 minutes is up. You know what we haven't done? Oh, no, it's eight, a lot. Eight minutes. We haven't well, you've got two minutes like, oh, to come up with a joke. Don't have a joke today. <laughs> what about a good little dad joke? I'm really bad at jokes. Go on. I find them, no, it's like <laughs> not delivery. I don't know many because I find them very cringy. Oh. Why the hell is that podcast called Rolls and Rolls? Because they're funny. <laughs> <laughs> funny looking. <laughs> Maybe. Um, what can I tell the guys that's funny? Oh, Ez left me in his hotel room for a few minutes on my own, so I started rummaging through his stuff and sent pictures of myself in his stuff. And I was going to get a pair of his underwear and put them on my head, but then I was so scared that it was going to be... A what kind of time? Yeah. <laughs> I bet she started rummaging through my stuff and putting my underwear on her head. <laughs> This is why I can't work for anyone else, by the way. <laughs> Stuff like this. Okay, that's us this week, I think. Damn. <laughs>